Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers, where the Missouri General Assembly is in the second half of the session with the end getting closer. And today we're having a follow up on what's happened so far and visiting with State Senator Bill White. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I know that uh, this is the year where you've moved from the House side to the Senate side. So some of the people who are watching might be curious as far as what's the perspective like on the other side of the Capitol? <laughs> well, it's, it's really very different. You know, there's only 34 senators, of mm -hmm. course, and there's 163 representatives. So uh, in, on the House side, it takes 81 other people and you to do something. On the Senate side, it just takes you because every, we have a filibuster on the Senate side, which mm -hmm. they don't in the House. And so that gives you uh, a lot of power, if you will, for what goes on on the floor and uh, you get to be heard. Uh, unlike in the House where you may not be called upon to speak, every senator gets to speak on any issue that they want to. So that it, it's a very nice change for that. You're much more able to represent your constituents, your views on the floor, get them heard. Try, you get your chance to convince all the other senators that you're right and whoever else is wrong. <laughs> right. So there is true debate and democracy. Oh, there, there absolutely is. Right. Well, you're representing, of course, a much larger district as a senator oh, as well. This is true. I have all of Newton, uh, Jasper, and Dade County. Mm -hmm. uh, my house district was primarily Joplin with a little bit of northern Newton County. Uh, we've been spending quite a bit of time in Dade County mm -hmm. uh, getting to know the people up there because, they're, again, they're totally new to me. Uh, so we've been having office hours up there every other week for two hours on Friday. After we get done with the session, we'll start uh, probably we'll drop back to a rotation where we'll then we'll start doing office hours around Jasper County, down in Newton County. We'll hit Seneca, we'll hit Jasper. You know, I have the view that I want people to be comfortable with me and that I'm willing to go to them to hear their opinions, not just that they have to come to us. Okay. So you want to be seen in the district. Yeah. You want I, to be I, I want them to be comfortable, know who I am as a person, mm -hmm. and be able to feel comfortable that they have a problem or an issue, they can call me. And of course, we're recording this program on a Friday during the legislative session. This is kind of your day off from Jefferson <laughs> City, more or less. <laughs> it is the day off from Jefferson City. It isn't necessarily the day off you have. A, this is we get back. We do a lot mm -hmm. of things on, you know, a lot of people want to meet with you, right. uh, a lot of events going on that are Saturday, and it goes into our Sunday sort Oh. So even though you have a session that's January to May-ish, year-round well, involvement we, continues. We do. It, it, the idea that it's really a part-time job is, is just not very realistic. If mm -hmm. you do your job at all well, I mean, you're out every day basically doing something. The, the younger guys and gals that have their business, I, that's got to be very difficult for them to do because there is so much demand on your time that you know a new business opens up, they'd like you to come and attend. Uh, there's meetings of different groups that they want you to attend. And right. you, know, you really want to be able to do that. You want to show that you're interested and listen to them, hear what they have to say. So it, it is really a full-time job. So being elected by the people to represent them, you are indeed yeah. representing them. So, well, people who are watching might be interested as far as the session right now underway. We're, as I said, we're in the second half now. You're uh, looking, end is getting closer. What is your general overall feeling on how things are going in Jefferson City this year? Well, uh, the Senate moves a lot slower than the House does. So always realize that, but now I'm getting to experience right. it. It's a, in some ways, it's a little frustrating because it does move so slowly. Uh, there's a tendency on the Senate side that when a bill actually gets to the floor is when serious debate starts. I mean, you get some movement on bills ahead of time, but uh, just the demeanor of the Senate is that you're, you work more on when a bill's actually on the floor. That's why if you listen to us, you'll hear us talking about sports or what we did for the weekend, and people will wonder why in the world you're doing that. And it's not that we're filibustering a bill, but that's when the push has come to shove and you finally got the two or three factions that need to be working out the details of a bill mm -hmm. to get it voted off the floor are often one of the side galleries or in somebody's office working. And with the way the Senate runs, we have to keep the floor open. So several times, well actually it was the second day of, of uh, being a senator, I had to talk for about an hour and a half about anything I could think of with uh, Mike Searpoy sitting right behind me. So the business still goes on even though it, you're not debating that bill. Right. We, we, you know, I try to and Depending on the scenario, I'd like mm -hmm. at least to talk about what is being discussed off the floor. Right. But sometimes it, when it's a long, arduous task, you just can't do that. And so you end up seriously talking about what your kids are doing <laughs> at school or whatever else. And people may not realize that behind the scenes work that goes on before you actually get to the point of, now we're going to really debate it here. Yeah. And that is a difference between the House and the Senate because on the House, they don't have a filibuster. Mm -hmm. And they also have a computerized system called AMI. It's in-house built. And all the amendments and changes to your bills are filed ahead of time. So you can see what's coming up and I, I may, I 
and when I was in the house, I'd file two or three amendments. I may not be going to offer them all, or I may want to have it. I put them out there, and I may pick which one to offer, depending on what else happens in the bill before I get to offer my amendment. The Senate doesn't have a computer system like that. I don't know what is going to happen to a bill when it hits the floor until it happens. If somebody has an amendment, if they want to put an entirely new, you know, another bill, attach it to this bill. I have no clue they're going to do that until they do it. Until you actually hear them say and, it. And mm -hmm. the problem, that can be a problem because if, if that bill hasn't come through your committee, mm -hmm. then you, you aren't aware of it, whatever state it's in. A lot of times there's uh, committee substitutes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden here's a 50-page attachment on this bill that is on a totally very almost not related topic. And it's like, then how do you deal with that? Right. Uh, I'm one of those people that reads. And you just got to read. You've got to know what you're dealing with up there. And so that, that's a, a difficult time. Most of the time when a large thing gets dropped like that, that, that is kind of obscure, it'll go on. So there'll be some discussion. And then it will be what we call laid over where they'll put it to an informal calendar. And that'll give us time to overnight or the next day, you know, to read really it and see what's going on. But mm -hmm. if that is not the case, they're not willing to lay it over, then that's where you have to you know, get up and have somebody take up time so the rest of us can read it and see what it really says. And then to be informed as a senator, you need to do your homework. And, and although, you know, I, I have in the past experienced, oh, this is the only thing in that bill. Well, <laughs> <Things are hidden. laughs> so much for the only thing in the bill. I mean, you really got to read. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I have some very good friends up there, people I do dearly trust, but you need to read everything just to make sure even uh, well, there's been drafting errors where people, they want something in a bill and they change something that and they may change something else. I actually had a scenario where my drafter didn't understand what I wanted and modified the paragraph I wanted, but also modified another paragraph. So it's taken on a different and, meaning. And it, so it, it messed up what was in that second paragraph, and mm -hmm. so that was a, a really quick have to fix it kind of a thing. Uh, Fortunately, that was caught before we ever got to the floor, but I looked at the one change I wanted, and it was fine. And mm -hmm. so at first blush, I didn't read the entire changes again, because I Already, it was my bill. I knew what they were. So we're tying that together. Well, I know uh, as we're recording this program in April, there's some news just came out yesterday that the Senate is working on trying to the transportation issues well, facing the state. Yeah, so. I actually uh, brought a little folder. I don't think I need to look at it. Mm -hmm. We we have a compromise amongst the factions. Uh, the House position was that they only wanted to use general revenue over four years, mm -hmm. about 100 million dollars a year for four years, and this is just again for this one-time fix. This is not in any way a addressing the long-term funding needs we need for our infrastructure. Uh, the governor's proposal had been bonding of uh, 300 and I think it was $51 million uh, over a 15-year period, and that would fix 250 bridges, uh, several of which are in my district. Well, the Senate modified that a little bit. We were concerned at that long period of bonding, so we were dropped it from 15 to 7. Oh, okay. uh, the House didn't like that. There was some discussion. The big thing that uh, came to our, our uh, the resolution, I think, our compromise, we also have a bridge we need to fix on I-70 just by Rocheport, mm -hmm. about 170 some million dollars to fix. Actually, it's Major replaced. Major interstate highway, it's, right. It's replaced. Uh, we have the option of spending $40 million to do a patch job that'll last for 10 years. Or we go after and do the whole bridge like we should do. Uh, we have put in a, it's an info grant from the federal government for infrastructure. Uh, we're requesting that. Uh, we To do that, we have to have matching state funds, not totally matching, mm -hmm. we have to have state funds committed. The House's proposal does not meet the requirements of that guaranteed fund because we can't obligate next year's legislature or any future legislature to allocate money the way we want them to allocate it now. You just passed this year's uh, right. budget. We, we passed this year's budget and they can do something different next year. Mm -hmm. When we bond, that's actually a debt and our constitution states the very first thing when it comes to money is we have to pay our debts. Right. That's before we pay for schools, before we do any other allocation. So it is a guaranteed payment. And so that meets the requirements we need to have for a guarantee. So that's why the we were so forceful, I think, in keeping the bonding proposal in there. And uh, the compromise is that in, in, instead of borrowing uh, $350 million, $351, we're going to borrow uh, $300, oh, okay. and, 301 actually. And this year we will do $50 million out of general revenue to start with. The bonding will start next year. Uh, therefore, we'll drop down to 215 bridges instead of 250. Uh, and that is contingent on us getting part of that infrastructure uh, grant. From the federal helping out. Right. So that, that's the trigger that kicks in the, the loan then, mm -hmm. or the, the grant from the feds, right. and kicks in our bonding issue.
So it sounds like compromise is a key to success oh, in many cases. It, it very much is, and, and you know both sides have very valid points. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea of having to go into debt, I, I generally wouldn't support bonding this for this project. I'm supporting a one-time bonding issue. It's not how, we don't want to have to come back each year. Bonding is not a long-term solution. Okay. This is to fix these critical bridges we need. There, they were smaller bridges. The jobs being under eight million dollars mm -hmm. that we were looking at. So secondary and roads. So, well, the, yeah, they're, they're U.S. Highway, like mm -hmm. uh, one six, two of the bridges are on 160 in Dade County, okay. uh, which will be very interesting because it's the only really major road going east and west in the middle of the county. And you cut it off when, to repair it. <laughs> one of them is actually, I think, a replace, and that, mm -hmm. I don't know where we route truck traffic then because it will be, you know, 15, 20 miles one way or the other to, to, to stay on a, a paved, you know, U.S. type highway. Mm -hmm. So that it will be challenging, but those are the things we need to do. One of the bridges is actually on range line going over the railroad tracks oh. down just north of 32nd Street. Mm -hmm. That bridge on the north end now actually has wooden blockage underneath it. It's it's still a safe bridge, okay. but in six years, uh, if we don't fix this, the bridge will be weight restricted and semis won't be able to go over it. So range line traffic would be it, altered dramatically. It would be, you know, and our commercial traffic, it, it would be a serious problem. So mm -hmm. these are bridges that need to be fixed, and okay. uh, some of them are actually closed. And I know we've heard from the Department of Transportation that this is a statewide problem and it's something right. that is growing. It's, I mean, you're talking it, about fixing it for one year, but that whole long term, what do we do about our highways yeah. and bridges? Well, we have the seventh most amount of paved roads of any state in the nation. Uh, our fuels tax is 49th out of 50. So worth it. Uh, we have not upped our fuel tax in a very long time. And the only people lower than us are Alaska, and that's because they have a lot of oil <laughs> <Right>. revenue. <laughs> so they aren't as worried about uh, the fuel tax. And so we are, we are doing, again, the seventh most amount of roads with the 49th. least... <laughs> 49th amount of you know income per mile you know mm -hmm. coming in for our gallon so this is a topic we're going to continue to hear we're about going to hear about it okay. we, we've got to come up with a long-term solution this is a one-time fix if you will. it's mm -hmm. the band-aid on a particular problem but yeah, it's, we haven't addressed the, the, the serious health care issues yet. <laughs> right. And of course, we're recording this program at Missouri Southern mm -hmm. at the television studio. I know people, especially here on campus in the community, are concerned about higher education funding, the budget side of things, well, and what might be happening in this year's outlooks. Well, we're still in markup on the Senate side, and mm -hmm. I did not get on the Appropriations Committee. There were nine new senators, uh, and we all wanted, I know we all asked for the appropriations. Yeah. One of us got it, and I was not that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know exactly what we're doing in markup. Uh, I have put my two cents in. Uh, uh, for maintaining uh, locally uh, MSSU, we're looking at a $1.8 million that was not able to be used last year, actually hopefully moving that into the core budget for the university, which will help. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a two, uh, $200,000 issued for Crowder. Uh, they, I think with their changes in administration, they had some interims there. Uh, they missed what's called a, a MoExcel program for requesting funds, and uh, I'm a little more concerned about us getting that one. I've put in my two cents that right. I really I'm want sure it and, and when, it, when it gets when it gets done with markup then they'll go to the mm -hmm. floor and I'll have a chance to look at it a little more and see if I can't find if it doesn't make it or it doesn't make it in its entirety we'll be able to try to find somewhere to take a little money and move it around we we get that option to do it now it, how successful we are may be another matter but and you face a timetable for getting that done I mean, oh, the legislative session yeah. has a deadline by yep. this date you have to yep. have the budget finished. that is the one constitutional requirement we have in the legislature so we have to have a a budget done, mm -hmm. and I can't remember the exact date. We have to have it done by, but, but uh, it's before it, you close it, the it's, session. It's before we close the session, yeah. And right. if we don't, I don't really know what happens to us. So it isn't like we all get thrown in jail, but right. maybe that would motivate us. We, we, in my eight years up there, we've mm -hmm. not ever missed that date. Right. I mean, we it creates some very long hours that if there's an issue and we're in conference committee between mm -hmm. the House and the Senate positions, uh, we have some all night conference committee discussions and things going on, but okay. we always get it done. Work it out until the end, yeah. right, and tying it together. Of course, in Jefferson City this year, you have still have the Republican-controlled legislature as well as the governor. People are probably wondering, you know, how are things working out with this uh, system that we have in Missouri? Well, this you know, it, it, it's kind of like what you see in the, the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, not We're not nearly as uh, gridlocked, but when you had uh, President Obama, and for his first two years, you had a Democratic Congress, mm -hmm. both the House and Senate, uh, President Trump, same thing for his first two years, had a Republican House and Senate, didn't get everything he wanted done. Uh, we're the same way. I mean, there's there's agendas we have uh, on the Republican side. There are some of our conservative things. Uh, we've got one tort bill we're moving through. I have the our sec number two tort bill on punitive damages. It's going a little slower. We'll see how it goes this year, what, what all we end up getting through. Uh, but within, especially having a supermajority, there are a lot of us that are Republicans, right. and that means there's lots of little subcomponents, little subgroups there, mm -hmm. and 
a lot of the debate we've had and the slowdowns on the floor have not been Republican Democrat. We we actually are very fairly nonpartisan in a lot of the stuff we do. I mean, I, I've had a Democrat bill put on uh, one of mine that I very was hap very so happy to have on with uh, the other side. Uh, oh, yeah, we you know I have a prior authorization bill that'll be coming to the floor next week uh, dealing with health insurance mm -hmm. and a very strong democratic support on that. You know, my, my issues may come from some of the, uh, I don't even think conservative Republicans, I'm not quite sure where it's going to come <laughs> right. from if it does, but uh, there are, there are, again, there are, we have groups that are very concerned about privacy. We have groups mm -hmm. that are very concerned about taxes. Uh, we have groups that are very concerned about social welfare. I mean, and you know, some of them cross party lines, some of them don't. And so it's a very interesting mix that just because, oh, well, I'm a Republican, I have this bill, that doesn't mean it's ever going to get to the floor or right. get through a committee. <laughs> right. we, we, one, we, our PDMP bill, that mm -hmm. has uh, been a big topic over the years, uh, that actually didn't make it out of a uh, committee the first time. And of course, all committees have Republican majorities. So, And in, in that, if I recall correctly, I think all the Democrats voted for that. And uh, one of the Republicans that favored it was out of the room. And so it ended up being a tie and you lose ties. So it had to be reconsidered and eventually mm -hmm. got out of committee. But it has not yet uh, been brought up and discussed on the floor. So. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if that survives. You have to go through and so forth. It is. You mentioned committees, and for our viewers, maybe I can explain which committees you are serving okay. on this year. Well, I'm on eight or nine committees. We have uh, five committees that are, you know, active that meet every week, basically, and then there's four that I'm on that meet quarterly or semi-annually or a as necessary. Uh, I'm chairman of the Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on Judiciary for the short term has a really long name. Uh, Commerce Utilities. I'm on uh, Healthcare and Pensions is put together. Okay. And general laws are my five active committees that meet every week. Mm -hmm. I'm on the, well, let's say JCAR, it's a joint uh, committee on rules. Oh, okay. Basically, when, when the departments pass rules, uh, they can be brought through us. Either we can raise questions or outside people can raise questions. Our jurisdiction is only that they have not exceeded their authority. So it's kind of a check and balance. It's a check and balance to make sure that they have, I mean, th we've had bills that I, that rules that I really, really don't like mm -hmm. and that nobody on, the committee liked, but they didn't exceed the authority we gave them in the bill, so we had to. It, we, it, it, went, it went through. We, we mm -hmm. couldn't do anything about it, even though we thought they were t it was a terrible rule, right. and we let them know that. We so that uh, I'm on the joint. Uh, the, it's a court automation committee uh, dealing with our computerization of our court system. Mm -hmm. And oh gosh, I've gone two others. I can't <laughs> think of off the top. They haven't met yet. But so on a regular <laughs> basis, there, you're at least four per week. Well, yeah, well, there's four, five. five you, per, pretty much five mm -hmm. per week. And then the, uh, say the other ones. JCAR only meets when necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. We can go a whole year without meeting if there's no issues that people bring up before us. Right. Now you mentioned veterans. I know a lot of our viewers are interested on bills that may be going through this year affecting the veterans and okay. concerns in our Well, we, we've got uh, one of the bills I've carried, we've got it over in the house right now. It uh, deals with education and active service. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had an issue where if you're tr being transferred into Missouri, uh, for our K through 12, you have to register. You have to be there to register with all your documents. That's a real problem for military people being transferred into Fort Leonard Wood or Whiteman or any of our other facilities because one, you're coming into the state, you want to have it set up so your kids can immediately shift over into school and not lose the days. Right. And while you're checking into a nudity station, the whole family, not just the, the service person, but the spouse, there's lots of things you've got to do, getting your housing Transition, ready. Right. So we're, we, this bill gives them a 10 day, they get to register early and they have 10 days to produce all the documents you need, shot records, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it also then deals on the higher education side, I don't believe it's happening in Missouri. We've had it in other states where uh, if you're stationed here in Missouri and you get accepted to MU, say, or MSSU, mm -hmm. uh, you're accepted in November, December, well, what happens if the family gets orders and leaves the state before you register in August? You've well, some of the states, some of the some universities are starting to say, no, no, you're going to have to pay out-of-state tuition now. Mm. Our bill says, no, your in-state, out-of-state tuition issue is settled at the time you're accepted when you're in the military. So that if your family gets sent to another duty station, uh, the, the students still, still get their, they mm -hmm. still rate in-state tuition. That, so, and that. those are, I, I think those are two really good bills we've had. We, are, we have a bill we're working on, Veterans Treatment Court. Mm -hmm. We had to modify it from the House to make it a little more equitable for how we do our treatment courts. But uh, the main push is that we want each circuit to have a Veterans Treatment Court. So all throughout the state, everybody all, has something. And if, if they can't, again, Veterans Treatment Courts aren't as heavily utilized as, say, our DWI courts, mm -hmm. our, our family treatment courts. These are basically drug-related courts. Right. Uh, we In some counties, they have waiting lists. They could double the size of their adult or their DWI court and still you know, not they have any room. Space, right? Whereas in some of our Veterans Courts may have two to five people in them. So it's difficult. It, 
it's hard for us to economically justify that we're going to force them to have a veterans court mm -hmm. when putting the money over here will treat so many more people. But veterans courts have been proven because they're ran differently than a regular adult court. They're more of a military style mm -hmm. and the success rate with veterans is very, very good. But one of the things we do in the bill is we encourage if get a couple of counties to go together to share the cost. Where again, if, it, if you don't need a, if you can't fill a veterans treatment court, get two or three counties to go together, mm -hmm. share that cost. Maybe you do a commissioner instead of a, a judge to, and could travel amongst the couple counties. Uh, the treatment courts have been a wonderful success in anything we've done with them, and mm -hmm. veterans in particular. So they don't have to stop at the county line. Right. They can say, we're going to talk to our neighbors and we, see what we, we can, can share. Do. I mean, we're, we're do you know, sharing is good. <laughs> right, right. Well, I know a big thing we hear about every year from the legislature is, of course, economic development and uh, trying to get businesses and jobs and so forth. There's been some talk this year about you know things such as the financial aspects of bringing companies to the well, we. That, We've got several bills out there. One of the one of the things I've, I'm I'm not a huge tax credit fan mm -hmm. uh, uh, for economic development, but on the training side of the economic development, uh, it's shows it's worth pretty much. I mean, we when you look at the people that we're putting through the, the dollars and cents uh, for the training components or economic development, tax credits I think are very good. Uh, they they produce income for us People in the state. We're actually mm -hmm. making money back. Uh, we have some economic tax credits that return two cents on the dollar, which I don't know why we still have. Yeah. But for, for our employment programs are very good. We've got, uh, uh, we, we just changed the name of one of ours to, it's gonna be One Start, and we've modified it to make it more accessible to our, primarily probably our community colleges, but also mm -hmm. four-year institutions. Uh, focusing a little bit more on the, I won't say the trades, but the, we're getting to the scenario now where instead of having a BA or an AA, you have certifications in IT in particular. There, mm -hmm. You may have 11, 12 different certifications and all you know it would equate to an uh, associate's degree or maybe close to a bachelor's, but it's not broken down that way. You go, you get this certification, you come back a little bit later, get another one. Mm -hmm. uh, we're encouraging that. One of the governor's proposals that I really like uh, is Fast Track. It's designed for people that are 25 and older that have been in the workforce. And my scenario would be you're, you come out of high school, you decide to not to while. go to, mm -hmm. you work for a while, you've done the entry level position, you have, you're ready to move on, but you don't have the training or the education to move on. This is a funding mechanism, grant type of program that would allow you to go back in, in certain areas. We, we This bill's still in the works, but right. uh, where the Department of Economic Development would pick the different areas, and it can be four year degree too, not just two or mm -hmm. just certifications, but qualify for that, you would then receive, be able to access money to go and complete those degrees, certifications. Uh, what we put on to it, a little different from the governor's original proposal, is we want them to stay in the state. So, so when you so, finish, you're going to live and right. work here. We, we, oh, I, we're talking a three or four year period. I think mm -hmm. three is what we have right now in, in one of the versions, where if you stay in Missouri for three years after that, then each year it's a third forgiven. Oh. So it's kind of like the programs we have coming out of high school, but there mm -hmm. we don't force you to stay in the state. Right. This is because we're doing specific training in economic development. Our neck of the woods, it's very easy to hop to Kansas, Oklahoma, right. or right. Kansas right. City. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no... You know, if you're not paying attention to where State Line Road is, you don't know if you're in you're Kansas City you're you're or, right. or you're in Overland Park. So that you know, it's important. I think that we don't want our taxpayers paying for people to go work in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And but that's, I think, it's a very good program. It has a lot of potential. Not only does it help that person move up to, you're going to get a better job. It's going to be you know better income. They're going to be paying more taxes because they have a, a new better job. Their job's going to come you're back the, to pay. Also, that introductory position is now open for the next person coming out of school that doesn't want to or somebody that wants to change. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're you know making an upwardly mobile but still very trained workforce in the areas we need. So that sounds like it's really specific to the workers. The it it is and, and the economic development will look at where the demand is. Uh, you know nursing has got, it, it, I mean you, you see the signs around here, $10,000 mm -hmm. signing bonus for a nurse. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I never did anything I got a $10,000 <laughs> signing bonus for. I'm saying I'm going to go to work for you. <laughs> right. but, you know, so those are the type of things that, and they can adjust that. Mm -hmm. You know, once you're in a program, they wouldn't be able to kick you out. But, they, you know, over a two, three year period, maybe we need more, there's more demand from the workforce for IT people. Right. And so we would make more available programs available in it. Right. So I, I think that has a lot of potential. Well, as you visit your constituents in the district, are there certain concerns you're hearing on a common theme from them? Well, you know, it, it, it really depends on where and who you're talking to because mm -hmm. uh, constituents are like legislators. They, they come from all backgrounds, all levels of education, all levels of interest. Uh, one person's really hot button topic, the, uh, the next person at Walmart in the line won't care anything about. Right. So it, it really varies. Uh, generally, our, we're in a much more conservative area and the, the major 
hot button, I guess, issues. You are very concerned with abortion, very concerned with gun rights. Uh, and we've had those bills this year, especially uh, we've had a series of bills that we just we had them in the Senate and then we had some come over from the House. We just passed through our health care committee uh, dealing more with the what if if Roe v. Wade is overturned by the Supreme Court. And there's a series of bills, uh, some of which are written so that they only come into effect if Roe v. Wade's if this overturned. this happens, this is going to be the right. right. And then, you know, those are a little dangerous to write just in that you don't know uh, a Supreme Court overturning doesn't mean it just goes away. Right, it's not they're, going, right. they're going to overturn. They're going to they're going to set new new guidelines. Mm -hmm. New the odds of them just saying up oh, we're totally out of the abortion discussion is probably not going to be there. There's going to be some difference. So and then it will be you know you'll have your legal challenges to where what we've done does how does it fit in with what the Supreme Court has mm -hmm. dictated is now the new level. Right. Uh, so there there's there's that sort of thing. There's always a process to go through for things that are happening. If someone who's watching would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way for a constituent to be able oh, to reach you? Well. Uh, they can go to our website, uh, our state website that has everything. Right. Uh, I believe in being accessible to people. I think my chief of staff is Mike Kelly, former representative. He had Dade County and actually most of Jasper County in the rural areas. Uh, so Mike's my chief of staff. We both are very available. We go to our website. My cell number's out there, which I actually have in my pocket here. Mm -hmm. uh, our emails are out there. Uh, you know, I, I will caution people, and when, right now uh, we had Amendment 1 pass uh, last time, and so there are issues with uh, the sunshine of our information. Uh, we de I'm an attorney. Uh, I think, and I think we're going to modify, so we have the same kind of attorney-client privilege, basically, that we would have with constituents. I deal a lot with health care, and I deal with constituents who are dealing with very personal problems, uh, you know, different health care needs, uh, criminal issues where you, you're involving rape, incest, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Those are things that are not, in my opinion, there, there's no re there, they should be sun not you sunshine. You keep them private with and the discussion. So, uh, what we're, we have our, our whole little guideline and how we deal with sunshine requests anyway, mm -hmm. but we have on each one of our emails a disclaimer saying, you know, before you send us stuff, be aware of what you're doing. Uh, we, we can like blank out social security numbers and things, but in some small areas, I mean, it's very hard to not, people can figure out who, who's sending who they are really. They, mm -hmm. It's close, so that's a, a concern. I hope we have taken care of by the end of uh, this session. I'm, I'm work, you know, Normal things we do, stuff with bills, I mean, that's mm -hmm. fine, but when we're dealing with personal problems with people that, that is not public, not, need to be public knowledge. Uh, but So that's my only concern on you know, phones. We don't have any recordings. So. Right. <laughs> but if you send an so email they, or send a letter, send, And sometimes we'll need, we'll need to have copies of forms if mm -hmm. you're fighting insurance when they're, they've denied mm -hmm. health care things, and we will need to have copies of that, which we do destroy as soon as we're done. And that's our policy. Once we're done with the issue, we destroy those Shredder. documents. We, there is no uh, retention. We have no retention requirements in the uh, legislature. Well, I know there's a lot happening, and I know we could go on talking about a lot of the other issues, but you keep us informed with weekly newsletters, on through oh. emails, a lot of things, and I appreciate you taking the time to help share with the audience today. Oh, I, it's my pleasure. I enjoy it, and I, I encourage people to uh, talk to, give us a call, also our state representatives, mm -hmm. and if you're out of the district, whoever your senator or state representative is, we need to know what people think. Okay. Well, Senator White, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. You're thank welcome. you for inviting me. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week on Newsmakers. I'm Judy Stiles. Hope you can join me again next week at the same time on this station. We'll see you then.